good evening friends and students from all over the country and i am glad to be beginning yet another meeting of the inform international nephrology forum friends the major topic of thrust today will be on renal biopsy and although renal biopsy is a basic procedure undertaken by most nephrologists in all the centers yet the technique varies and uh, there are many variations in doing renal biopsy and the results the quality of the renal biopsy would depend on the methodology and today we would try to discuss this at length and uh, uh, very interestingly we have a pathologist with us who would uh, tell us you know how she would like to have the biopsy specimen to be so that we as nephrologists can hone our uh, expertise on getting a good renal biopsy which would satisfy the pathologist so that our uh, diagnostic uh, outcome will be much much more and we have uh, professor narayana prasad as the chat person and uh, panelists professor sondarajan professor vandana niyar and the speakers would be anila abraham pathologist from chennai and dr suraj nephrologist from kochi and besides the main topics we have practice tips how do i do it like in all meetings where an interesting uh, presentation of alcohol can save lives by dr harsha from uh, meenakshi mission hospital and a small uh, tidbit on guiding the guide wire by me so before i go into the meeting as such let us uh, introduce uh, and the chat person and the panelists professor narayan prasad is too well known to all of the audience here he is uh, head of the department of nephrology in sanjay gandhi postgraduate institute of medical sciences lucknow and uh, he is uh, you know has notable achievements like uh, he has led most of the societies in india presently he is the sitting secretary of indian society of nephrology he is the deputy chair of south asia regional board of international society of nephrology he is council member of international society of nephrology and a member of isn american nephrologists of indian origin india committee and he has had post important posts as secretary of indian society of organ transplant and peritoneal dialysis society of india some time ago and he is uh, stellar performance in each of these postings are too well known he is a task master and an achiever and he has proven his presence in most of these posts and he has plenty of publications and he has contributed to many books he is a great teacher and he has trained empty number of uh, dm graduates from post graduate institute of luck then we have professor sondarajan senior consultant of nephrologist who has very graciously come to be a chair uh, panelist in this meeting he finished his mbbs from madras university and went on to do his md and dm in madras university and it is very notable that he was uh, the best outgoing student in mbbs and md and he has had a very brilliant uh, educational career and he went on to have phd in uh, medical pharmacology you know much later after becoming a faculty he is in uh, F, uh, he got his frcp from glasgow in 2014 he was a former professor of nephrology in sri ramchandra medical college after uh, uh, being a professor of nephrology in kilpock medical college in government service he has made uh, several publications of nephrology articles in more than uh, 20 international and uh, 26 national journals and notably recently he got the lifetime achievement award from his team dr mgr medical university and currently he is a consultant nephrologist in apollo hospitals jubilee hills hyderabad welcome sir next the star guest of our program today is dr vandana duaniya she is professor of medicine and division of nephrology in emory university atlanta 
He is the director of vascular access quality program in Emory Dialysis. It is very interesting to know that she had her medical schooling in our country from Rotec, and she had her postgraduate training in Army Hospital, Delhi, before moving on to US to have her nephrology fellowship in Emory University. And she is holding very important posts right now, and she has achieved so much in an alien country. Presently, she is the secretary and treasurer of ASDIN, the premier uh, society of uh, international nephrologists in the US. And uh, she is the president elect for ASDIN. So she is going to be the next president for ASDIN, which is a great honor to all of us Indians here. And uh, she is in the board of directors of Kidney Health Initiative in ASN and FDA joint venture uh, presently for the years 2021 to 23. And she is the chair of certification and accreditation committee of ASD. She holds editorial ship in many prestigious uh, uh, societies and uh, journals, ASDIN, the Open Urology Nephrology Journal, Clinical Nephrology, Journal of Vascular Access, to name a few. And she has been a peer reviewer in uh, many number of uh, journals, and she has had many honors and awards, and it is uh, a matter of uh, uh, great uh, importance to mention that she holds her ICMR Fellowship Award, you know, uh, still close to her heart, uh, which was the stepping stone for her, much of her later uh, achievements. And her publications uh, run into hundreds and uh, varied topics, and more relevantly, they are all related to interventional nephrology. Welcome, Dr. Vandana. And next we have Anila Abraham. She is a consultant pathologist running her Renopath Lab, Center for Renal and Neurological Pathology in Chennai. Uh, she finished a medical school in Christian Medical College, Ludhiana, and had her pathology training in Sri Ramchandra Medical College, Chennai. And she went on to specialize in uh, renal pathology uh, as a fellowship in renal transplant pathology from Louisiana State University, uh, US. And her area of interest is restricted to renal pathology and genitourinary pathology. She has had uh, more than 60 publications in indexed and international journals, and she has authored chapters in two books. And it is a uh, uh, great uh, uh, pride to mention that at a very young age, she has become one of the leading lights in renal pathology uh, in the country and she has references from most centers from South India. And she has been an invited uh, uh, speaker in the International Society of Nephrology, and she can, uh, runs a continuous medical education program for postgraduates as web meeting periodically. And I welcome Manila Abraham. And next we have Dr. Suraj. He'll be talking on uh, uh, renal biopsy, and uh, he is a alumni of uh, Kasturba Medical College, where he did his MBBS and MD, and he finished his uh, nephrology training as a DNB trainee uh, in uh, Meenakshi Mission Hospital under the tutorship of uh, Dr. Sampat. And after spending some time in uh, Kasturba Medical College Ashton Rose of Medicine, uh, he is practicing at Cochin uh, as a uh, Consultant nephrologist in Polakulat Narayan and Renai Medicity, Kochi. He has had uh, many publications, more than 40 publications, and particularly his uh, uh, paper on percutaneous real term ultrasound guided renal biopsy would show his uh, expertise and experience in this topic of interest today. Welcome, Dr. Suraj. And Dr. Harsha would be presenting the very intriguing topic. Alcohol can save lives, if not lives, the catheters. So uh, let us see what he has to say in his uh, presentation as tips for practice. Once in a while, sorry? No, you carry on. Yeah, once in a while, we get uh, a biopsy where the needle has gone tangentially 
and it's basically the subcapsular area. So instead of seeing the capsule at one end of the core, what happens is sometimes we see the capsule along the entire length and then we know that it's just gone under or through the capsule. So that has a problem in the sense, especially if it is an older patient, we know that the outer cortex is the least perfused. So the chances of having scars and uh, global glomerular sclerosis is very high in the subcapsular area. So if that tissue alone is given, we may wrongly uh, assess the chronicity <clears throat> and call a tissue as, you know, a, I mean, extensive glomerular sclerosis or ifta, whereas actually it is just in the subcapsular area. So make sure that the needle goes through and through perpendicularly through the capsule. And another important thing, what all pathologists really would like to have, especially if you're doing a biopsy to differentiate in a nephrotic syndrome, is to make sure you get the juxtamedullary cortex because that's the area where the earliest lesions of FSGS are there. So we would want the cortex, the entire length of the cortex, and as well as the um, little bit of the medulla so that we are sure that the juxtamedullary area has been sampled. Now, the most important thing is how do you assess the presence of renal cortical tissue? So this is a picture that's been widely circulated. It's there in multiple journals. It's almost there in all the presentations that people have. And I'm, I'm proud to say that I was trained under uh, Dr. Walker. He's my mentor. And I take great pride in showing you this picture. But along with that, let me just tell you, it's not always that you have such beautiful looking cortex and medulla. If you have, if you see this under a dissecting microscope or a handheld lens, then you're very lucky. You know that there are glomeruli here. You don't have to think twice. So this is a, a cortex showing beautiful glomeruli. This is a cortex, uh, sorry, this is a core showing only the medulla. This is the collecting tubules or the, the blood vessels surrounding the collecting tubules, which run parallelly. So you can see basically what you're seeing here is just the RBCs. So I would say around 50 to 70% of the time, you can, uh, you'll be able to see a glomeruli like this. Sometimes, even if you have got the cortex, you will not be able to see glomeruli as red uh, globular structures. And that's when you have globally sclerotic glomeruli. So there is no blood in them. So you, they will not appear red. They appear pale. Then it becomes a little difficult, especially for the first year uh, resident who's just getting trained you may not be able to, if you have this picture alone in mind, then you may miss out the cortex and wrongly think that you don't have the cortex when it's actually the cortex. So even if it's a pale area, you it could be the cortex. Sometimes the glomerulus is so hypercellular, typically in an IRGN, infection-related glomerular nephritis, it's hypercellular, the capillary lumen are obliterated, there's no blood in the capillary, so then again, you will not see the red area. And also, if there's extensive interstitial fibrosis, you may miss it out. But if you see this, this is the ideal thing. But don't expect to always see this sort of a picture. Now, this is something that I found really interesting, which I just got from Twitter a few days back. And this is this person has beautifully demonstrated how he has just used a Zoom adapter on his iPhone to look at the adequacy of the cores. He's taken three cores. This is the capsule and the uh, extra capsular soft tissue, three cores, and if you look carefully, he zoomed it up in a the 10x, that is 100 times magnified, and you can actually see the glomeruli. So he's got three cores of beautiful glomeruli, and this is identified. He did not use a dissecting microscope or a handheld lens, and this is just with this adapter that's been uh, used. So I was very interested in this. I did a Google search, and it's available in Amazon here now. So this can be easily put in the pocket and all you have to do is just clip it up because um, we always during pathology lectures, we tell the clinicians use a dissecting microscope, but we know practically not many pathology departments have a dissecting microscope. So we cannot expect a, um, the biopsy room in a medical college or a nephrology unit to have one. If you have one, that's very fine. But if you don't, this is a very good alternative and it's relatively uh, pocket friendly also. Uh, so you could try doing that uh, to look for the glom uh, main cortex and the medulla. The next thing is how many cores of biopsy should you take? And if you don't have in enough, how do you triage those, uh, the tissue? Ideally, ideal situation, you have to take three cores. That is if you're planning for LM, IF, and EM. 
But if you don't want TM and you're just doing an LM and IF, you have to take two cores. That's ideal situation. And I would say around 80 to 90% of the biopsies we get have two cores, one in formalin and one in Michels. But sometimes it's not so you're not able to get three cores or you're not able to get sufficiently um, what you require for all the three procedures. This again is a paper by Dr. Walker and this picture has been used so many times. But uh, you remember that this was published in 2004 and things have changed so much after that. And not many people are actually cutting the cores into two and taking both ends and using one core for LM and the other for IF and vice versa. In fact, it so happened, it was just a coincidence that just a few days back, Professor Chang, he is a uh, nephropathologist at the uh, University of Chicago. He put up a poll on Twitter to just find out. He put this picture and he put a poll and just asked how many of you actually do it. It was a coincidence that I had this talk to prepare and I just took a screenshot of it and I'm just sharing this data um, to just uh, show you that uh, just a quarter of the people are actually cutting up the tissue and sending it separately. Vast majorities just send them intact and it, they leave it to the pathologist to um, you know, cut it up or use it uh, more suitably in the best possible manner. So this is how we stand. This was 2004 and this is how we stand among this is a questionnaire uh, answered by the nephrologist in 2021. So this, I think, would be the most important uh, slide in my talk today. And um, that's the one that I'm sure the nephrologists are also most interested to know. If by any chance, due to any reason, the patient has bled or the patient is not cooperative, you get only one core of tissue. How would you proceed? Now, there is no hard and fast rule or there's no proper guidelines to that saying, yes, you have one core. This is how one, two, three, four, you have to do it. It definitely and it only depends on your clinical diagnosis. Like if you have done a biopsy uh, and your clinical diagnosis is it's a tubular interstitial disease, you want to know whether it's acute tubular injury or acute interstitial nephritis, or it's a postpartum patient, a uric patient, you want to know whether there's cortical necrosis or TMA, or it's just ATI or AIN. In those cases, you really don't need an IF and you can put the di tissue directly in formalin. We can always do IM and EF in that. But however, if your primary diagnosis is you know, it's a glomerular disease, you, it's a proliferative glomerulonephritis, or it's an immune complex mediated disease, that's your clinical diagnosis, then you would have to put the tissue in either Michels or saline and give the entire tissue for IF and leave it to the pathologist to do the other things. It's also wise to have a proper understanding with your pathologist how he or she would like the tissue. Because earlier, uh, for many years, we would always um, prefer the tissue in saline, do immunofluorescence, that is we freeze the tissue at minus 24, take sections, do the panel of uh, IgG, MA, C3, C1, Q, Kappa, Lambda. Then we melt the tissue and take it out of the chuck from the cryostat and put it in formalin for around four hours. Four hours is more than enough for that core to fix. Then you process it routinely like how we process. So that's one way. So you do the IF first and then you reprocess the IF for light microscopy. The, um, the difficulty there is there will be some fixation artifacts because for many hours the tissue was not fixed. You could do an EM but there would be compromise, quite a bit of compromise in the quality of the electron microscopy because it was not fixed. Now, the newer method that is relatively new in renal pathology is we are now able to do immunofluorescence on the paraffin block. So that has really changed uh, a lot of things for us. So if you have one core, just put it in formalin and send it to the pathologist. We will do uh, HNEPA, silver trichrome on it. Then on the same tissue, we do a procedure called antigen retrieval. I'll tell you what it is. And then we cut the tissue for immunoglobulins, uh, C3C1Q and Kappa Lambda. And then we can also, whatever tissue is left, we melt it out of the block and we can do an electron microscope. So with just one tissue, we can play around with it. But the guiding thing, whether to first put it in formalin or in Michels would be your clinical diagnosis. So that's the important thing. So it's not the pathologist who decides where the tissue has to go. I would give the benefit of, uh, you know, 
deciding to the nephrologist to his clinical diagnosis to decide where the tissue has to go. Now, having said that, we are really almost, we are always very worried about the patient. The patient has undergone an invasive procedure. You are worried whether you've got enough tissue. So in that, um, in that uh, you, you shouldn't get distracted and leave the tissue to dry because your whole procedure will go waste if the tissue dries up, especially in summer under the fan or under the air conditioner, the tissue can really dry up. And then whatever you do, the tissue will be of uh, inferior quality and it will not be probably suitable for many of the tests that we routinely do. If at all you have to cut the tissue, make sure that you use a, a fresh scalpel or a fresh uh, razor blade and one clean cut is, uh, is you know, to be used. You shouldn't go in an up and down manner and uh, you know, uh, really pulverize the tissue. Please do not use forceps to squeeze or pull the tissue. And also make sure that you completely submerge the tissue in the fixative. Because if the tissue is stuck to the wall of the uh, microfuge tube, it will dry up. It's as good as the tissue not going in. So when you place it in, make sure it goes right deep into the tissue and it's uh, completely surrounded by the fixative. And you have to make sure that the container is closed tightly. You don't want the tissue to leak, the fluid to leak out and the tissue to dry up. These may sound very silly, but many a time we get tissue um, which has dried up because the container was not sealed tightly. Now, the next thing is what are the fixatives that you would like to use? And before that, the first question is we always talk about fixation. Now, what is fixation? So it's a procedure by which we prevent the tissue from undergoing autolysis. And we want to literally fix. We want to keep the tissue in its morphology in a lifelike state. And for that, formalin is an aldehyde fixative. It's very useful. What it does is it forms covalent bond. These are protein molecules within the molecules as well as between the molecules. So it forms these bridges or cross linkages that we say, which will hold the tissue intact so that um, the tissue doesn't crumble up. The morphology is maintained. And that's how you have the glomerulus open and the capillaries open because of the tissue is fixed. So for light microscopy, we all know we use 10% neutral buffered formalin. It's easily available. Every histopathology lab will have it. It's cheap. You can just store it at room temperature for many months together. It's not going to get spoiled. The tissue, once you put in formalin, also remains uh, well preserved for many months. You can take out the tissue months later and do the test. It, it will be quite good. And most importantly, you can do all the special stains. You can do immunohistochemistry and you can do electron microscopy on a tissue that's fixed in formula. So it's like the, the most useful uh, fixative in renal pathology. But you cannot do immunofluorescence studies. That's a big drawback for formalin fixation. But now we have ways to circumvent that and we have found techniques where we can even do immunofluorescence on the formalin tissue. I'll show you those uh, pictures later. The other fixative, uh, fixatives that were used but not as popular as formalin are boins and zencers. This is a picric acid based fixative and this is a mercuric acid based fixative. The advantage of that is they give very beautiful cellular details, very crisp nuclear staining. So your pictures are going to be really good. But the disadvantage is you cannot do all the immunohistochemistry or EM on the tissue that's fixed. So that really brings the um, uh, advantage down. So most of the labs now use formula. What about electron microscopy? We all know glutaraldehyde is a very popular fixative. However, it has its own problems that in the sense that glutaraldehyde has to be prepared fresh. It has to be kept under refrigeration and the tissue cannot lie for many months or even weeks in glutaraldehyde because it becomes very hard. So if at all you are just planning to keep the tissue, you, you haven't decided whether you want the EM. You have taken the tissue and you are waiting for the light and the IF or probably at a later date the patient has caused issues or you want to preserve the tissue, then you have to preserve, preserve the EM tissue in formalin because the tissue is not going to get brittle. Um, but whatever fixative, whether it is uh, formalin or whether it is glutaraldehyde, the most important thing is it has to be immediately placed in fixative because within minutes autolytic changes take place especially the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum, they swell up and they form a lot of artifactual changes because a typical example being 
when COVID-19 first came out and we had a lot of autopsy studies being done and uh, the Chinese group came up with two, three publications where they said there are viral particles within the cytoplasm. But later they found out they were actually autolytic changes because they were all done on autopsy specimens. So the tissue had undergone autolysis and it was only the organelles, the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum that had stolen up and they were misinterpreted to be viral particles. So that is how much the change can happen under um, if it's not immediately fixed. Now, uh, what about immunofluorescence? The main thing is you should not fix the tissue for immunofluorescence. It should be sent either in saline or in a Michel's transport medium. Saline is good if you have an in-house pathology department or if it's within a few hours, you can get it to the pathology. But if, it's an, if you are couriering it to another city, you have to use a Michel's transport medium, which will keep the tissue stable. So what does it do? When you look at immunofluorescence, it's very important that the proteins, the antigens are intact. See, when I showed you the picture of formalin, I showed you how you have cross linkages between proteins. Now that should not happen in an immunofluorescence because we are putting antibodies against the antigen. So the antigen should be free to be uh, for the antibody to come and bind to it and for the fluorescence to take place. If there are cross linkages here, the antibody cannot bind and you will get a false negative test. So make sure that formalin doesn't touch here, cross linkages are not formed here and the tissue for immunofluorescence is not fixed. The most important question now is how is the specimen adequate? You know that you've taken the cortex, but what is the pathologist going to say about the uh, tissue? And that again depends on the pathology. There is no golden number. Some uh, articles come out with seven or 10, but those are just arbitrary. You don't have a fixed number to say, yes, this tissue is adequate or it's not adequate. Because you, we all know one glomerulus is enough to make a diagnosis of membranous nephropathy. Whereas even if you have uh, 60 to 80 glomeruli in a you know, FSGS may still be missed out. And also uh, now we do the activity and chronicity scorings for lupus, for IgA, for all the transplant biopsies. So when you have to uh, quantify or when you do a semi-quantitative assessment, you have to make sure that you have a proper sample size. Otherwise, the assessment is going to be completely wrong. BAMP is very clear. They've come up with very clear guidelines. Two cores of cortex, 10 non-sclerotic glomeruli, and two arteries is their adequacy. Now, this may sound a little too um, overwhelming for a first-year re resident because many a time we get only one cortex, and then you may always wonder whether the biopsy report is going to come up as inadequate material. But I'm just going to show you a few cases where diagnosis can be made just even without the cortex. This is just renal medulla in a biopsy, which we picked up um, BK polyoma virus. This is uh, C4D staining in the medulla. There was no cortex in the biopsy. This is a native kidney biopsy, which had only renal medulla, but the diagnosis of acute pyelonephritis can be made very clearly without a doubt in just the medullary tissue. And this was a biopsy where the needle went really deep in. In fact, we had some cores showing um, the urothelium, the transitional epithelium of the renal calysis. And this particular case ha had papillary necrosis. What you see is the tip of the renal papillae and they are necrotic and in a patient with pyelonephritis and diabetic nephropathy. So even a tip of papillae, if you get, depending on the condition, you can make a diagnosis. This is a case of renal medulla with a myeloid, especially the FO lipoprotein type 4 and type 1 are known to be exclusively in the medulla. So if you don't have the medulla, you don't get the diagnosis. So it's not always necessary that you have to have cortex. It depends from case to case, from pathology to pathology. This was a biopsy. We had the cortex, but no glomeruli, but we don't need the glomeruli to make a diagnosis of light chain, kappa light chain deposition disease showing light chain restriction. Medulla with um, pigment, pigment um, uh, tissue here inside on the h &E stain, Masson trichrome showing a cast, the pigment cast, and you do a myoglobin stain, it's positive. So rhabdomyolysis based just on the renal medullary tissue. A cast nephropathy just on medullary tissue. And finally, we always say for FSGS, you need a lot of glomerulus, 
this particular biopsy had a single glomerulus and the patient and the clinician and the pathologist were very lucky that that one glomerulus had segmental sclerosis at the tip so we could make a diagnosis of FSGS tip variant with just one glomerulus in the biopsy. So this is just to make you understand that you don't have to worry whether you have one or ten because it really depends on the disease and that's something not really in your hands. After all, it's a blind procedure and you are trying a bit of your luck in getting as much as tissue as possible. Though technique, I'm not saying technique is not there, but in the end, where the needle hits and what, the number of glomeruli you get really is not in your control. And this is a diagnosis of medullary angitis where the disease is only in the renal medulla. And if you don't have the medulla, you cannot make it. This was a biopsy we reported a few days back with the medulla showing extensive hemorrhage, leukocytoplastic vasculitis. And this would have been missed out if the nephrologist had taken only the cortex. So that was about it. And finally, what are the ways in which we can effectively use limited tissue? I showed you about diagnosis made on uh, limited tissue. Now, can we stretch it a little bit more and extract some more out of it? And that's when the new paraffin immunofluorescence is uh, playing an important role. These are the antigens. And I told you when it's fixed in formalin, cross linkages are formed. So if somehow we can break these cross linkages and expose the epitope for the antibody to bind, then we could do an immunofluorescence technique. And now we have enzymes. Earlier it was only heat, but now we have uh, pronase or protease, which will break down these linkages and expose the antigenic site for the antibody to bind. And we can do an immunofluorescence on a paraffin fixed a tissue also. So the, it's now nothing is going to stop us from doing the entire panel of testing. And finally, we can even do an electron microscopy from the paraffin block though you need to remember it's a salvage procedure. It is not suitable to identify thin basement membrane or early alphods because you are freezing and then you are heating the tissue and there will be artifactual changes in the thickness of the GBM. However, this tissue is quite good to pick up electron dense deposits. You can pick up organized fibrils, but it may be difficult to differentiate whether it's a fibrils of a fibrillary GN or that of an amyloid. So those subtle differences will not be uh, visualized in a paraffin embedded tissue, but you will be still be able to uh, support your light in the IF diagnosis. Finally, the last slide, you've done a very good job. Do not forget to label the containers uh, because it can cause a lot of confusion in the pathology lab and make sure that the label on the container for, uh, corresponds with the uh, request form that you send the patient's name and the number, age, uh, the same. Make sure you seal the tissue and you pack it if you are couriering it. And most important, the clinical information you provide to the pathologist along with the biopsy is of utmost importance to get a proper diagnosis.